Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I sit here in my 35 square meters of glorious gym empire once again, ready to drink schnapps and answer all your insightful questions. Need a bit more, actually. Uh, Emmanuel asks, um, what would you recommend, what exercises would you recommend to a previously active athletic 18-year-old woman who is aiming to get drafted to AFL Women's and wants to minimise risk of ACL injury. I would recommend her exercise to be running at great speed away from AFL because they're thoroughly determined to injure everyone who comes under their care. Man, woman, child. They probably even step on small animals. Every year, AFL puts out an injury report for the men, and uh, it was somewhere this year, somewhere between 34 and 36 injuries per club annually, an injury being defined as something that make, makes them miss at least the next game. And uh, they have 44 players on average. So over three quarters of them are getting injured and missing games. And they only have, at most, 23 games in a season. So they're getting one and a half injuries per game. Now, to be fair, it's not all in the game. Sometimes it's in training. Yes, that's right. They're not even actually playing, but they still get injured. But we can't question the training. So, generally speaking, the AFL are numpties. And we know this because the injuries don't drop from year to year. Now, some people make excuses for them and say, oh, the demands of the game, blah, blah, blah. But what you're really then saying is that they are unable to train them effectively to cope with the demands of the game, which is to say they're admitting incompetence. Now, setting that aside, the women are getting higher rates of injuries. There was a, an atrociously bad piece in The Age this morning uh, talking about that and saying, boo-hoo, everyone's worried about the women's, they think women are too fragile to play. No, nobody's saying that. They're just alarmed that the women are having a higher rate of injury. Now, there are three reasons that the women are having a higher rate of injury. One is that AFL, like many other sports in Australia, has a big feeder system um, in high schools and even primary schools in some cases where they take these kids and they train them up. Now, it's what's happening here isn't so much the training, it's a selection process, a brutal selection process. When I was in the army at one point, uh, I needed to get my 5K run time down. And uh, I was doing it just under 20 minutes, I think. And I got it down to 17 and a half. But in order to do so, I was having to tape my knees before every run. I was having to ice them afterwards. And I was popping anti-inflammatories like licorice. Don't try that at home, kids. <sighs> Meanwhile, there are other guys in the group who were doing it in 15 and a half minutes with no problems. So I learned then one of the great truths of athletic endeavour that people never really tell you about, which is that it's one thing to be able to reach a certain level of performance, and it's another thing to have a body which can uh, sustain the workload required to stay at that level of performance. You think of someone like Tatiana Kasharina, who has clean and jerked 194. She's been doing 190, 194 uh, for uh, several years now. Bang, up there. Bang, up there. Bang up there, 90 kilograms or more of force through each shoulder again and again and again over several years. That's a remarkable body that can handle that workload. Most will break. So with sports like AFL men's um, or uh, boys or girls swimming, uh, they've got the feeder systems. So people break, but they're breaking at 14 or 15. They don't yet have that feeder system for women's AFL. So instead of breaking at 14 or 15, they're breaking at 25 or 30. So that's the first factor. They haven't yet weeded out those who can't handle the workload. 
in future years, this will change. I just have to adjust the phone here. In future years, this will change, um, and they'll get more of a feeder system. So there are a lot in there now who won't, wouldn't get in there in five or ten years. And you'll see some quite remarkable players in the years to come. Now, the second factor is that a lot of these women are training a lot of the time, or they're playing a lot of the time. Because AFL Women's doesn't pay much, they're doing other sports, other codes going through the year. So they don't have an off season in which they can rest and truly recover or in which they can strength train or condition or whatever they happen to need to make them better. The third factor is that the AFL doesn't know how to train people to avoid injuries. As I said earlier, the injuries are pretty consistent year on year. They're just not getting better. Uh, you know, famously today there was, uh, or this weekend, there was a briefcase with little gelatine snakes in it and they had a ration for each player, a different number of gelatine snakes for each player to make sure they had the exact right glucose level for their... Uh... Whoops. For their game. Um, because, you know, God, if you had an extra snake, what would happen? You know, if you had one too few, what would happen? Oh, my God, how awful. So, they just don't really know how to train people. You, you can't rely on them. So those are the three factors which make me recommend against anyone doing AFL, women or men. But if you insist on doing it, then a good base of strength, build a good base of strength with squats, deadlifts, presses and so on, a good base of conditioning, learn the skills, the movement skills, because the knees aren't getting wrecked in collisions with other players, the knees are getting wrecked, uh, you know, stepping to one side and the like. And I would recommend playing only that sport and having an off-season. As much as it might hurt you financially, it will keep your body intact. But anyway, AFL's a stupid sport. It's like, a, like when you throw a chip to a flock of seagulls. Matt asks, why don't the, lifts, the weights lift themselves? Matt, they do. They do lift themselves. Haven't you ever gone into the gym and found that, like, there are plates on the bar? And when you ask around, everyone denies having left them there? It's like Toy Story, man. When you're not there, the plates jump up onto the bar and the bars go up and down. They do lift themselves, but not when anyone is lifting. Jama asks, working around elbow and knee injuries, such as recurring tendonitis. I'm afraid, James, this is one of those it depends questions. Um, depends on the nature of the injury, uh, the severity of it. The thing about tendonitis, as an example, is it takes a rather large insult to the body to make it happen, but then it doesn't take much to make it recur afterwards. So you just have to find the movements which make it flare up and avoid them and the movements which uh, don't make it flare up and work them as hard as you can. And if everything makes it flare up, then I'm afraid the only solution is a vasectomy to make sure that you don't pass your bad genes onto the general population. Now, what else? Uh, James also asks, is there science between volume uh, creating hypertrophy and uh, strength equals intensity? Yes, you lift heavy weights to get better at lifting heavy weights. You lift weights for shitloads of reps and it makes the muscles grow. Uh, lifting heavy weights also makes the muscles grow. Uh, but the main thing is just to go hard and each time push yourself to the limit. That stimulates the maximum muscle growth. 
And then whether or not your muscle grows depends on whether you provide it the material to. It doesn't matter what your workout is, if you go home and eat a stick of celery, you ain't growing much. So yes, there is some truth to it, uh, but the main thing is uh, eating lots of good food. Jones, who's very busy with the questions this week, also asks, uh, is there a ceiling to your strength when you reach a certain weight? Yes, it's called the world record, Jonah. Um, say if I want to increase my numbers, do I have to go up in weight category? Yes, if you're close to the world record, then you may need to go up a weight category. Most of us are very far from that, and uh, we just need to keep lifting and working hard. Getting bigger makes it easier for the lifts to go up, but uh, it's not necessary. Unless you're underweight, it's not necessary. Uh, James also asks, say I'm stuck in a gym hotel for a month and I want to maintain my strength and all the gym has a Smith machine, a leg press, a set of dumbbells and a few benches. Is it possible to maintain strength with this equipment? Uh, find a better hotel, man. Or a local gym. Yeah. Find a, find a better place. And if you do, ha uh, if you for some reason can't, you're in some bub barrack place like Sydney or something uh, you just have to make the best of it uh, so yeah you can maintain strength uh, I've mentioned before on this thing uh, a guy I trained uh, Ramon who trained hard with barbells and then at one point he um, didn't have access to a decent gym so he just messed around with kettlebells and um, you know in 18 months he's, 18 months later he tried to big deadlift again and he could still deadlift 170 it was unchanged so yeah it it takes a lot to build the strength but it doesn't take much to maintain it all sorts of random fuckery can maintain it including a smith machine uh, lachlan uh, interrupts us to ask why the fuck is overhead press so hard to improve because lachlan you have turned down many a chance to work out at the best gym in the neighborhood A bit more seriously, it's because um, they're just small muscles involved, so they're small to grow. You need to eat, lock. Uh, Lahira asks, can you talk about the Allen Thrall rest between sets video? Yes, most people do not need to sit around for 15 minutes rest in between sets. Any workout that takes more than two hours has got either too many sets or too much talking. What I see here in my gym generally is too much talking. Uh, so it is generally a good idea to get your ass moving it will only benefit your gains in uh, the long run if you get your ass moving uh, essentially about a total of about five minutes per set so that's that's about a minute to get under the bar a few minutes rest and changing the weight plates and then go again so six sets shouldn't take you more than 30 minutes uh, the exception might be is if you know you're up there doing singles and doubles at m massive weight when you're peaking for a powerlifting competition. Otherwise, uh, you know m you're just fucking around. Uh, which you know we don't mind in our gym; it keeps things friendly and social. But it is nonetheless in the end fucking around. Uh, and a good way to save time, as Alan Thrall mentioned, is to uh, superset your warm-ups with your work uh, your work sets. Uh, that is, if you're um, doing squats and overhead presses, uh, once you get to your work set on squats, you start warming up your overhead press. Then by the time you've finished the work sets on squats, uh, you'll have finished the warm-ups on overhead press and can go on to that and superset it with your deadlift or whatever else you're doing that day. Heather asks, strength training on its own can get boring and doesn't feel like it's inc increasing strength of your whole body. What's the best complementary exercise for all-round strength and to beat the boredom? Heather, I may speak to you bluntly because I know you. Add weight to the bar. If you find 70 kilograms boring, make it 72 and a half. You might feel apprehension or fear or dread, but you won't feel boredom. Add weight to the bar. That's how you get stronger. It's, 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 don't tell anyone, but that's, you, you add weight to the bar, you get stronger. 
Theo asks, can I make lots of lifts with smaller weights to make me look buffed? Yes, you can. This has been studied. People have made gains even on as little as 40% of their one rep maximum. But they did shitloads of reps. It was things like doing, you know, three sets to failure three times a week for 12 weeks. If you can do that on your own, great. That'll work. But you'll be miserable. You go to failure, whatever the sets and reps range, whatever the weight, you'll make gains. If you don't injure yourself, you'll make gains. But it'll be a miserable experience. I don't recommend it. Um, Rosie asks, can cardio through riding a bike mix well with lifting? Yes, bearing in mind, as I said uh, with Aiden's question a couple of weeks back, um, that when you're training multiple qualities at once, you're going to be mediocre in all of them. You get to be good at one thing at a time. Sorry, there's not really any renaissance woman of sports. Uh, if, um, if that's your talent, then you'd be a decathlete. James asks, what's a reasonable expectation for improvement past newbie gains? Um, my experience is uh, past the novice three to six months, most people can get about 50% beyond that. So if you uh, struggled up to 100 kilograms squat in your first three months, you might, you know, uh, within 12 months get 150. You're probably not going to get 250. The guys who got 250 probably got up to 140 or 150 in their first three months. So, you know, about 50% beyond that. Um, that's not really a physiological limit so much it is as it is a lifestyle limit. People, there's only so far that most people are willing to go. There's only so much they're willing to give to the gym. Uh, but in the end, it's over to you. James also asks, why, does my, why do my snatches suck? They're just hard, James. Sorry. He also asks, are you my real dad? Ask your mama. Someone anonymously asks, why schnapps? Why not whiskey? Well, I have to explain that whiskey is a drink invented by the Scots who are so barbaric and impoverished, they don't even wear pants. In the strength training world, nobody really likes whiskey. They just pretend to because it's a good way to suck up to a certain strength training guru. And somebody told them it was masculine. Whiskey is made from fermented grain mash. And the proper thing to do with fermented grains is to turn them into beer. Whiskey is an anglicisation of the Gaelic word for water, which shows the amount they drink and which no doubt affects their intellectual capacity. Now, a word about schnapps. American schnapps is made by taking a, a neutral grain spirit, probably made from timber offcuts or something, and adding fruit syrup. And like most American foods, on no occasion, no occasion is this fit for human consumption. Proper schnapps is made by fermenting fr fruit and distilling the result. It adds sweetness to your life and is an excellent way to get your daily two serves of fruit. Perhaps. My God, I actually got through them. Well then, I think it's about a time to say good night to you lot. I hope this has given you a laugh or informed you or something. Ah, oh, there was one other question. Why did it not print out? Marion had asked, why do you do snatches at all? Because they're awesome, Marion. Because you take a weight from the ground, a heavy weight from the ground, and you fling it up overhead, thus showing to the world a big, fuck you, I am strong. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have given you tonight probably more wisdom than you can handle. There are other approaches, there are other answers, but they are wrong. You can do things other ways if you want, other than the way I advise you. But then you must accept that strong is not for you. Good night.